All right, so today we're going to be talking about the SI units. And this is uh, from the French Le Système International de Unité, which just literally translates as the International System of Units. Now, there are seven SI base units, the kilogram, uh, which is a unit of mass, the meter, which is a unit of length, the second, which is a unit of time, the mole, which we're going to become very familiar with, is a unit of substance, uh, the ampere, which is a unit of electrical current, the kelvin, which is a unit of thermodynamic temperature, and the candela, which is a unit of luminous intensity. All right, and next up we also have a few uh, units that don't have any special terminology to them. Um, those are called the uh, coherent derived units uh, without any special names. For instance, we have here the volume, which can be measured in cubic meters. We'll also be seeing volumes in terms of liters uh, later on, but uh, we'll see the relation between those. Uh, area can be measured in square meters. Velocity can be measured in meters per second. And acceleration um, can be measured in meters per second squared, although we don't really use that too much in chemistry. Now on the uh, right-hand side of the table, you can see a whole bunch of derived units that have special names and symbols. We have up here uh, units of force, which can be measured in newtons. Uh, pressure, when we start talking about uh, the gas laws, we'll see the pressure that can be measured in pascals. Uh, grays and sieverts, uh, these are used commonly when you're talking about uh, radiation exposure. On the next line here, we have uh, units of energy or work or heat. Um, these are all measured in joules. Uh, watts, which is a measure of power, which is uh, you know units of energy per second. And we're very familiar with uh, watts because you have uh, you know so many watts in your light bulb or your toaster. And if you look on your electric bill, you know they talk about kilowatt hours. Um, as you're taking the unit of power, multiplying it by time to get the energy back out again. Uh, the Becquerel, that's the unit of activity. That's uh, basically how fast the uh, radionuclide uh, actually decays. We won't really be talking about that too much this semester. Uh, hertz, that's the unit of frequency. That's 1 over seconds. You may also hear it referred to as cycles per second. Uh, you heard of, uh, you know, for instance, the 60 hertz frequency in the power lines or your uh, AM, FM uh, frequencies are measured in kilohertz and megahertz, uh, gigahertz for your microwave. So, you know, we'll be talking about these later on. Uh, catalytic activity, don't worry about that. We're not going to worry about those. Uh, Weber's, that's a amount of magnetic flux. Um, inductance, that's another thing in electrical terminology. Uh, we also have magnetic flux density, which is the Tesla. So you're probably familiar with the Tesla being the car but it's actually named after the uh, Serbian scientist uh, Nikola Tesla uh, and it's a very very common uh, unit for magnetic field intensity. Uh, Coulomb on the next line is a unit of electrical charge so we'll be seeing that when we start talking about electrons and their charge of the electron and the charge of the proton. Uh, then we also have volts which is the voltage or electromotive force You've all heard of that, you know, the, your 9 volt batteries, uh, the volt, the 120 volts coming out of the, uh, the sockets on the walls. Uh, so this is, uh, we'll be, we might be looking at this a little bit later in the semester. Um, also, we have decreased Celsius. Well, that's related to the Kelvin. It's simply just offset by it, and we'll talk about that um, a little bit. Uh, Farad, that's a unit of capacitance that has to deal with electrical circuits as is resistance, which is in ohms, and the inverse of the resistance, which is called conductance, or in Siemens. And down here on the last line, uh, these are related to the uh, candela, which we have the uh, illuminance, or lux, and the lumens. So if you look at your uh, light bulbs nowadays, especially that they have the, uh, the CFLs and the LED bulbs, a lot of times they're listing the um, intensities and the fluxes of these in terms of lumens and luxes. So this way they can uh, give a better idea how bright the light bulbs are in relation to you know, what we used to be used to, the, uh, the incandescent bulbs, which used to just be you know, the amount of watts coming off. So this way it tells how bright they are without actually talking about how much power they're using. Um, and then we have steradians and radians, and actually we'll talk about those uh, in a little bit. So first up we have the meter. Now the meter is defined as the length of the path traveled by light in a vacuum during a time interval of one 
over 299792458 of a second. Now, how this comes about is that we know that the speed of light is a constant. This comes about from Einstein's uh, theory of relativity. And the thing is that the speed of light is defined to be exactly 299792458 meters per second. And therefore, if we know what a second is, we just take the inverse of that, and then we know exactly what a meter is. Next up, we have the kilogram. And this one is a little bit different than all the other ones because this is defined using an international prototype mass of the kilogram. So there is literally a hunk of metal sitting in the vault in Paris uh, that is defined to be exactly one kilogram. And there's a whole history on this, and I'll uh, you know, link in a video there so you can watch about the history of the kilogram. It's actually a very fascinating uh, read on this. Uh, one thing to note, that this is the only base unit that has an SI prefix, which is the kilo. Um, so you have to just be aware that the kilogram is the SI base unit, not the gram. Um, that's very important. You have to just be aware of that because otherwise your units may not work out properly. It's also very likely that this is soon going to change because, uh, as with all the other constants here, let's say you're trying to talk to some alien civilization and you want to tell them, what we are using for our base units. Well, we're going to get into a problem uh, with the kilogram because while the meter and the second, we can go there and tell the aliens um, exactly what to do, and they can, you know, basically build up their own standard on their own planet. With the kilogram, they have to come here and find out, well, what the kilogram actually is. So this is kind of a problem. So what we're going to be doing is redefining it uh, there's some possibilities. One is using a watt balance, which is actually uh, going to use Planck's constant um, in its definition. And another possibility is uh, by making a sphere of silicon, uh, where you can literally just count how many silicon atoms you have in there, and then you will know what the mass of that ball of silicon actually is. So there's the two competing w methods, and this is probably going to happen within the next uh, few years. So just you know, keep an eye on that. Uh, next up is the second. And this is defined as the duration of uh, 9192631770 periods of the radiation corresponding to the transition between two hyperfine levels of the ground state of the cesium-133 atom. Here we have a little uh, schematic diagram on how a uh, cesium atomic clock actually works. Now there are many variations on the different types of atomic clocks, but this is a pretty good example of uh, you know the basic one. All right, so up on the uh, top portion there, we see that we have two types of cesium atoms, one in the high energy state and one in the low energy state. And these are separated by that 9 gigahertz uh, energy difference that uh, we are seeing from the definition. So the red balls are representing the high energy um, cesium atoms, and the yellow ones are representing the lower energy states. So what we first do is we just take some cesium, place it in an oven, and then when it heats up enough, we get uh, cesium atoms to come off. And it's going to be a mixture of the high energy and low energy states. Uh, this beam of cesium atoms uh, travels until it reaches a pair of magnets. And then these magnets can actually separate out uh, the different uh, states of the atoms. So in this case, the low energy atoms are deflected and the high energy state uh, just continues in a straight line and is just eliminated from the system. So as you can see, the uh, yellow um, balls are uh, deflected. And then they enter this microwave chamber. So this microwave chamber has uh, the 9 gigahertz radiation. So it can uh, take the low energy atoms and then promote them to make them into the high energy state. And then it exits the uh, chamber there and then those uh, can be deflected by a different pair of magnets into a detector. And then that detector can detect how many um, cesium atoms have actually been converted. And then this detector goes into a feedback circuit, which uh, goes into a quartz oscillator that controls the wavelength of the microwave radiation. So it's basically a feedback loop. Uh, if the microwave radiation is the wrong wavelength or the wrong energy, then uh, not as many uh, atoms will actually be converted 
and then the intensity at the detector will drop off. And I say, well, wait a minute, that means I, my radiation is the wrong energy. I have to adjust my radiation a little bit. It will do that, then it sees more atoms actually coming back into the detector, and then it knows that you're at the right, correct resonance frequency. Now, part of the reason why they chose uh, the 9 gigahertz and change uh, you know, frequency there, for and they, why they use cesium, is first of all, there's you know not many competing uh, you know resonances that we might have to worry about. Also, at the time when this was developed in the mid 1960s, you know they need to be able to actually count nine billion and change, uh, you know things every second, and that was basically the limit of the electronics at the time. Nowadays, we can actually count much faster, but you know the standard has been set by uh, cesium, so it's just a matter of counting very, very accurately uh, those uh, 9 billion and change uh, frequencies every second. And then once that is done, um, you, know, you just keep doing that over and over and over again, and uh, you have a very, very accurate clock, which is you know, accurate to uh, seconds per billion years. Uh, as for uh, leap seconds, which occur every uh, couple of years on Earth, uh, this uh, is too correct for the slowing of the Earth's spin. So, you know, as we redistribute mass over the Earth, uh, you know, as you know, water moves around, um, also as the Moon is slowly moving away from the Earth, you know, this can uh, affect the, the length of a day, and we need to account for little leap seconds to uh, make sure that uh, you know our days are so aligned with the stars in outer space. All right, next up is the Kelvin, which is a unit of temperature. Uh, it's a unit of thermodynamic temperature, and it is a fraction of 1 over 273.16 of the thermodynamic temperature of the triple point of water. All right, now why we use the triple point of water, we have to look here at the phase diagram uh, for, and this is really not just for water, but um, for any substance. We, we have our three phases, liquid, solid, and gas. So we have something which looks kind of like this. Okay. So over here, this is going to be my pressure, and this is going to be my temperature. So in these three different areas, we're going to have solids, liquid, and gas being the predominant phase. Now, for what we're looking at, let's say we're dealing up here, one atmosphere, so that's going to be our normal atmospheric pressure. Uh, over here would, of course, be you know our zero degrees Celsius. So that's, of course, when water melts and, and becomes liquid. And then if we keep going on to this point, you know, this would be 100 degrees Celsius, where water boils. But as we decrease the pressure, um, you know, our boiling point is going to start decreasing. And if you've uh, ever been in, you know, the mountainous states like uh, uh, Denver, you know that uh, they have to boil the water, it boils a few degrees below 100 degrees Celsius out there. And if we keep lowering this down, eventually we're going to reach a point where the boiling point of water intercepts with the, uh, the freezing point of water, and this is where we call uh, the triple point of water. And this occurs at, uh, over here, 0 0.01 degrees Celsius. And if we extend to our pressure on this side, this is going to be 0 0.06 oops, atmospheres. So 0 0.006 atmospheres. So about 0.6% um, of atmospheric pressure. So it's a very, very low pressure. And you can't really achieve this unless you're in vacuum-like conditions. And the reason why we choose this point, rather than using regular old uh, freezing point of water, is because uh, this point here is an invariant point. It only occurs at this pressure and this temperature, and nowhere else. Meanwhile, the freezing points um, can occur at different temperatures and at different pressures. So we'd have to know what the pressure is and what the temperature is for this to occur. Um, and also, if we were using the boiling point, we'd run into the same uh, situation over here we'd have the uh, boiling point would be up here at one atmosphere and then would slowly decrease as you decrease the pressure so that would be a very very bad standard to use but the triple point this is invariant meaning it doesn't move um, it only occurs at one temperature and one pressure and here we have a small 
little dish of water which is uh, being placed under vacuum. And as the uh, pressure is dropping, um, eventually it's going to cool off enough that uh, solid, uh, which we can see right about here, uh, actually starts forming. So here we have the three phases all at the same time. So we have the solid, liquid, and gas all coexisting. And this is you know, an example of seeing the triple point of water. So you have literally boiling water and boiling ice um, all at the same time there. All right, next up is the mole. Now this one has a bit of a long definition here, but we are going to become very familiar with the mole um, in a few weeks. So the mole is the amount of substance of a system which contains as many elementary entities as there are atoms in 0.12 kilograms of carbon-12. When the mole is used, the elementary entities must be specified and may be atoms, molecules, ions, electrons, other particles, or specified groups of such particles. Um, essentially what this is doing is setting up a conversion factor between uh, the mass of actual atoms, individual atoms, and what we're actually using in the lab. So this way I can go to a scale, measure out 12 grams of carbon-12, or you know, 0.012 kilograms of carbon-12, same, same thing. And I will know that I have exactly one mole of carbon-12. And this is very important because when we're going to be dealing with uh, different masses of, uh, you know, let's say, you know, hydrogen and oxygen, iron, for doing a reaction, these are going to be happening between individual atoms. So we need a method to convert between the mass of substance that we have and how many particles we actually have. So this is just going to be very important um, when we're going to be dealing with uh, chemistry. So we'll be seeing a lot more of this um, as time goes on. Um, another way you can kind of think about the mole is if you are dealing with, let's say, a dozen. So, for instance, a dozen um, eggs contains 12 eggs, a dozen people is 12 people, a dozen planets is 12 planets. So it doesn't matter what you're actually talking about, all it matters is how many things you actually have. Alright, now the mole, he is kind of cute, um, so we're going to become very familiar with him, and it is celebrated every October 23rd. And the reason for this is because Avogadro's number is 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd. October is the 10th month, 23rd, so that's why it's celebrated between 6.02 a.m. and 6.02 p.m. on the 10-23rd of the year. All right, next up is the ampere. You may have also heard this referred to as the amp. All right, now this is a bit of a long-winded definition. Uh, here, the ampere is the is that constant current which, if maintained in two straight parallel conductors of infinite length of neg negligible circular cross-section and placed one meter apart in vacuum, would produce between those conductors a force equal to 2 times 10 to the minus 7 newtons per meter of length. All right, now as for the ampere, um, it's a bit of a strange definition, but you know, just to illustrate what we were actually looking at here, essentially what it's saying is I have two wires you know, of infinite length, so these just keep you know going on and on, right? So these are just keep going on. And they are separated here by one meter. And there is this current going through them. Okay, so they got the current going through them. And when a current flows through a wire, it produces a magnetic field. And when you have these two wires uh, you know, just going next to each other, because of these magnetic fields, there's going to be a slight little attraction between them and you're going to get a slight force between them, which is going to be 2 times 10 to the minus 7th uh, newtons per meter of length. Okay, So that's what you're going to observe for this. It's not exactly a practical uh, definition because you know it says you have to have infinite wires, which obviously do not exist. Uh, when it's saying negligible cross-section, that just means that the wires are very, very thin. And uh, each of these would be carrying a current of 1 ampere. So that's, that's just the gist of uh, what this is actually talking about. And then finally, our last SI unit here is the candela. So the candela is the luminous intensity in a given direction of a source that emits monochromatic radiation of frequency 540 times 10 to the 12th hertz. 
and that has a radiant intensity in that direction of 1 over 683 watts per steradian. All right, there's a lot of uh, mysterious words in this definition, so let's try to break this down a little bit. Uh, 540 times 10 to the 12 hertz. Uh, this is yellow-green uh, light. Uh, monochromatic. Mono means one. Chromatic means color. So that literally just means one color of light uh, that has that particular frequency. And the um, intensity of 1 over 683 watts. So a watt is a unit of power. And this next one here is a steradian, which you probably haven't encountered before, even in your math classes. Um, you know that in a regular circle, uh, we usually count you know, angles in terms of degrees, but there's also radians as well, and a full circle is 2 pi radians. Well, a stir radian is a unit of solid angle, so instead of a radian being on just a regular circle, a stir radian is uh, on a sphere. All right, so a, you know, the area of a sphere is 4 pi r squared, so a stir radian is about the area of Asia. If you look on a globe, the, the area of Asia relative to that of the Earth. All right, now as for the candela, we're probably not going to see this again in chem class, but you know we just want to uh, show you what all the definitions are. As for the ones that we'll be using in class, the ampere and the candela, these are the two that uh, we won't be using quite that often.